Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Muriel and you're ready for a deep dive into episode 6 of Amazon Prime's The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of... Oh my god, there was so much stupid in this episode. <laughs> episode 6. No, you know what? I need to say this a bit more. Was so full of stupid. So full of nonsense and just stupid. But so, it actually opens with Adar, the sensual gardener. Because <laughs> the opening shot is Adar's hand grappling at some soil. I don't think it's meant to be sensual, but that's how I read it. And you see him planting a little seed. And then immediately you see him basically giving a pep talk at a little military rally, <laughs> including the people from, you know, Bronwyn crew who joined the baddies and the orcs themselves. Happy to report that, um, Potato Creep, that's his official name now, seems to be doing pretty well in the crowd, so yay for him. Adar explains that it's the time of the orcs and this land is going to be ours and I'm gonna take care of all of you because he's their dad, so yes, he's basically Mr. Proto-Orc. The why does he still kind of look like an elf is my question, because if he's one of the original elves that was corrupted by Morgoth, why ain't he himself an orc? An Uruk? No, you're not gonna tell us, obviously. Okay, so moving on from that, you basically get Discount Helm's Deep. And I freaking called it, because you see the Orc army with Adar and Potato Creep walking up to that tower hold where Bronwyn and crew and Rondi and Theo are supposed to be holed up. It's at night with torches. It's an obvious callback to the Battle of Helm's Deep. Don't tell me it isn't because it is. They get in and it is empty. Well, that's pretty strange. No one's home. Could it be an ambush, don't you think? Why doesn't anyone there think so, actually? Because Zadar's like, uh, where's everyone up, though? And the orcs are like, but there's no one here, though. But guess what? It is exactly that, an ambush, because a Rondir is hiding up in a corner. And then he starts shooting arrows and stuff. And he shoots a flaming arrow at the actual tower. And the arrow hits a piece of rope. <laughs> and, oh my god, this was so fucking stupid. The rope breaks very conveniently. Why did the arrow have to be flaming? Because, I'm sorry, the rope did not burn down that quickly. It, that's not how rope burning fucking works, but okay. And apparently this rope was part of a massive scaffolding structure that was keeping the tower propped up, and as soon as it snaps, all that scaffolding falls away, and basically the tower starts collapsing, and I'm like, yo, this tower's been there for centuries, and if it was that structurally unsound, how in the hell did it not collapse before now? Just, uh, yeah, someone lied to uh, the, the village council's building regulators because what the fuck was that? So very conveniently, the tower collapses onto a shit ton of orcs, but not a dart, obviously, and a rondir leaves. And then you basically see the actual villagers. I'm going to call them peasants because, you know, why not? So Bronwyn is, you know, leader of the peasants, and they're actually down? from the watchtower back at their original village or just not far from it. They also have torches in the night. So why didn't the orcs see them? Find them? The geographical logic here, you guessed it, is non-existent. <laughs> you know, before I move on, I need to state this. Hashtag Adar is actually the good guy. Hashtag justice for orcs. Because so far, Adar is like one of the nicest characters. Yes, he's a baddie, but he's a baddie who cares about his people. Kind of. I mean, he also, you know, bears orcs' arms to be burned by the sun. But still, he wants his people to be at peace in the land and not be massacred and chased away by the goodies and stuff. He cares. He's their father. He's their daddy. So, yeah, hashtag Adar is actually the good guy here. <laughs> then we are with the Numenorean war galleys. Oh, three of them. <laughs> also, they look a bit small. I'm like, how are they actually holding a hundred men per ship with presumably their horses? No one knows, but no one needs to know. Am I right? So you see a sealed door on deck and Gally walks up to him. And Gally has a braid now! She changed her hairstyle. Good for her. So she walks up to Isildur. Isildur asks her, can you actually see the coast of Middle-earth? Because far-sighted elves, am I right? And she says, yes, I can actually see it. Should the elves actually be able to see that far away? Me thinks not quite. 
But fine, I'll give it a pass, that's a minor thing. The elves do have magical eyesight and shit because you know Legolas and the whole what do your elf I see? Fine, I'll give him that. So they have a bit of a chat and Isildur, you know, he wants something from his voyage to Middle Earth and he goes on a spiel about how he doesn't feel Numenor is the real Numenor anymore but he feels it inside of him and I'm like, the show hasn't really portrayed Numenor as it should actually be. So, yeah. But why should Isildur know what the real Numenor is like since he grew up in the fake Numenor? Again, logic was missing here. But um, yeah, I guess he's referring to the fact that Numenorians are racist asshole who worry about the Turk gerbs. So fair enough. And Isildur also expresses, oh, I don't know, desire to be a warrior and to be respected, to brush up on his male ego pride. And so bow pride, Gally replies with a bit of wisdom, very surprising from her, I might add. She gives him a line about how pride is not that much of a good thing. And oh yeah, you shouldn't be so prideful that you dismiss humble labor or some shit. And I'm like, bitch, that's rich coming from you, just saying. Then Isildur walks off all happy about having had a chat with Galadriel, commander of the Northern Armies. Yay! And then Elendil walks up and Elendil has a bit of a chat with Gally. Nice little moment talking about Elendil's dead wife. No one cares. And also about the fact the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Why, thank you, Elendil, for this very basic lesson in everyday observable astronomy. Yay! That shit isn't deep. I'm like, again, showrunners, this is not deep. <laughs> no. But then, I couldn't but observe just one in a long, long list of absolute absurdities to do specifically with military stuff. I am by no means an expert in military strategy, in military history, or military armaments, etc. But, you know, along the years I've picked stuff up here and there, and there were things in the show where I was like, bitch, even I know that's absolutely fucking ridiculous. So item number one, armor. Gally has chainmail. That covers this little zone of the body, as you would expect, because that is actually a very sensitive zone, as we're actually shown later in the episode. You get an arrow there, a spear there, it could actually nick an archery. No bueno. Yet Elendil has cloth there. So I don't know, I guess maybe it's the pauldron, so the space between the pauldron and the... well, it's not really the gauntlets, but y'all know what I mean. Basically, this area covered by cloth. Not even leather, not chainmail, as you would expect. Cloth. And I'm like, unless that cloth is fucking Kevlar, that's very stupid coming from someone about to go into fucking battle. Gally's armor, yes, chainmail, good. Um, Elendil's armor, uh, cloth, fucking stupid. And then after that, it kind of cuts to five seconds of Elendil talking to Miri about traveling and travel time. Keep that in mind, actually, that, you know, it'll take us a couple of days to traverse the zone of Middle Earth they need to traverse to get to the Southlands. And even then, it sounds way unrealistic, but <laughs> not as unrealistic as what actually happens later in the episode. Cut back to the Southland peasants with Bronwyn, Arondir, and Theo. You see Arondir trying to destroy the evil sword key thingy. <laughs> and uh, something interesting is going to happen with that later in the episode as well. So he tries to smash it with a hammer, something, an axe, whatever, but it breaks. So the evil sword key thingy is indestructible. Well, and after that, it's basically a montage of the peasants preparing for battle, trying to fortify their huts, gathering arrows, and covering wheelbarrows and hay carts with tar pitch so they can just shoot it with flaming arrows to go boom on the orcs, whatever. It's all prepping, basically. They're also covering up all the tunnel holes the orcs dug so they can't creep up on them that way, though something interesting is going to happen with that as well later in the episode. And then Bronwyn and her son Theo have a bit of a moment. A lovely little son and mother moment. I didn't really care, but fair enough. Mum who loves her son, son who loves his mum, that's nice, that's healthy, good. So Theo is a bit conflicted, you see, because he wants to participate in the fighting, but he's also a young lad, so he should stay with the more vulnerable folk in this one building. How is that going to protect them in any specific way, given they're still in the village where the fighting will occur? I don't know. But once 
wants to get, you're not supposed to think too deeply about these things, you see. And Theo asks his mum to reassure him because when he was a little kid, he was afraid of the dark or something. So fair enough, he's a young teenager, but he's still a boy, you know, so he needs his mum's reassurance. Fair enough. <laughs> but then Bronwyn says, if you find the light, then the darkness will not be able to find you. And I'm like, um, Bronwyn, you... You might want to say that to Gally. I think Gally needs to hear that because she has kind of the opposite philosophy. I think yours is healthier. You might want to give her a, a little chat. Yeah, be her shrink. Yeah, I mean, she's a herbalist, so you know she's a healer. So you need to shrink Gally because she really needs that wisdom. She's really, you know, convinced that you have to go dark before going light. Um, yeah, she needs help. <laughs> then you have this little montage. You see the peasants preparing and family members hugging, lovers, married people hugging and exchanging words of comfort and encouragement, etc. with a background of supposedly emotion eliciting music. Okay, then we cut once again to to Bronwyn and Arondir, and they're by a tree. And Arondir explains to Bronwyn, you know, we have this little ritual as elves that before we go into battle, we plant the seed of a tree specifically. So that's actually what Adar, the sensual gardener, <laughs> was doing at the beginning of the episode, because he's still technically an elf, so he was also planting a tree, even though um, his orcs have kind of massacred the landscape. But again, don't think about these things too deeply. No, no. Stop. You're not supposed to. So Arondi explains his little ritual, and so he takes the seeds that Bronwyn gave him in episode one or two, those special Alfrin seeds, and he says we should plant one. And then after the battle, assuming we survive, we'll plant the others. And then he kind of, but not really, name drops Yavanna Kementari, who is the Vilar responsible for nature and growing things and animals and stuff, but I guess her name? is not in the material they have the rights to. They have the rights to Aule, they have the rights to fucking Manway, but not Yavanna. Okay, fine, minor thing. At this point, we show she's kind of alluded to. And then fucking finally, <laughs> Bronwyn and Arondir kiss. Mm -hmm. Big smooch with emotion in the eyes. And I was like, fucking finally, you're supposed to be lovers and star-crossed lovers from different races, species, what have you. you haven't kissed yet, and I mean, kissing is PG-13, all right? There's kissing in the Lord of the Rings. You want to keep it family-friendly, kissing is family-friendly. So they finally exchange an emotional lover's kiss. Yay. We move on to act one of the fighting. Night has fallen, and the villagers are very tense, expecting the orcs, the baddies, to come to them. They have to cross a bridge, you see, and from the moment they cross the bridge, they're supposed to start shooting arrows, setting fire to those hay carts and wheelbarrows they lathered with pitch or something. And so, as you would expect, yes, the orcs arrive, Adar's baddies, or at least a first contingent of them, of course. So there is fighting. It is actually quite gory. I was mildly surprised. I was like, y'all are cranking up the gore. Damn. <laughs> All right, so blood flies everywhere, guts. I was like, how are these peasants, you know, such good archers? You didn't really see them train. I mean, archery is a skill you actually have to practice over time. But again, we're not asking questions here. So arrows are flying. Orcs have archers, the peasants have archers, peasants have pitchforks, knives and shit, and they hack at orcs, and orcs hack back at them. <laughs> and you have a couple of these classical tropey, in the nick of time, saving the character who's about to die from another character who cares about them. You have this with Bronwyn being saved by a Rondir, and a Rondir who's about to have his eye poked out whilst... <laughs> The orc, whose eye was poked out by Arondir, heavily bleeds on him. Mmm, that was delicious. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's about to get shanked, but orc gets shanked first by Bronwyn. Yay! But despite what you might expect, given the peasants are clearly at a disadvantage on every possible metric, really, they win fighting act one. And they discover that among the dead, among the baddies' corpses, are... <gasps> fellow peasants. And there were Pikachu faced about it. And I'm like, y'all know that some of your peeps went to join the baddies with potato creep? Like, why are you surprised? But of course, like I said, it was only fighting act one. Initiate fighting act two. Yes, there were more orcs in the woods and more orc archers and an arrow flies and oh no, Bronwyn gets shot about this place, which apparently is right above a major archery. So no bueno for her. She's knocked out, basically. A Rondir takes Bronwyn to this building, barn, I don't know what, where Theo and the more vulnerable peeps are holed up. And he lays her out on this, 
I don't know, table. And Theo is very worried, and Arondia is very worried because uh, Bronwyn, she's losing a lot of blood, which, you know, makes sense since a major artery was nicked. They can't staunch the bleeding, so they basically cauterize the wound, and Bronwyn dramatically passes out. And for a few minutes, it was a bit drawn out, in my opinion. You kind of wonder, is she actually dead? Arondia looks very sad and upset. Theo is very sad and upset, understandably, to be fair. And yeah, Bronwyn looks, for all intents and purposes, quite dead, though, I mean, there are ways to check that someone is still breathing, you know, the whole spoon under the nose thing, or just checking the pulse. Just, no? Okay, okay, all right, we're not supposed to think about these things. And actually, I did wonder for a hot minute there if they were going to have the balls to actually kill her off, but no, of course, after those five minutes of being dramatically passed out, she regains consciousness. And then you cut to a once again classical slash tropey. Here comes the cavalry scene. But no. <laughs> See, here comes the cavalry is a classical trope. It can be pulled off very well and be very emotionally satisfying. Only it wasn't here because, again, abjectly stupid details here. I don't know how, but apparently um the Numenorean army was fast traveled to kind of right outside the village or, you know, at the entrance to the valley where the village is. Not quite sure about the geography there again, but I mean, you're not supposed to think about these things too deeply, right? So they're just galloping towards the villages. How do they know where they're supposed to go? How did they fast travel so fucking much? Because <laughs> like one moment they're on the boats and one moment they're charging towards the village. And okay, this is clearly meant to be knockoff, Ride of the Rohirrim. You all know that's what it was, because that is what it was. We had Discount Helm's Deep, now we have Discount Ride of the Rohirrim. Except, of course, it doesn't land. And I must say, up until now, I haven't really had any issues with the cinematography as such, except for the excessive use of slow motion. That cavalry galloping scene actually looked bad. I mean, that's my opinion. I think it really looked bad. It looked fake. I don't know why. Was it a question of <laughs> the lens use? I mean, I'm not versed in cinematography techniques, to be fair. Was it a question of the color grading? Or the horses, harnesses, and protective armor looked like it was actual plastic. It didn't look good at all. It just looked fake. It looked like a reenactment, <laughs> not like I was in Middle Earth. And that's the first time I really had that impression. Like here, the cinematography was actually bad. Then back to the village, it's being overrun by, you know, the Orcs Act 2. The baddies are winning, people are dying left, right and center, and the survivors are basically being, you know, shepherded and cornered into that building where Aronde, Bronwyn and Thea are staying. And Adar comes in, triumphant. He exchanges a few words with Aronde in Quenya, again, <laughs> very minor quibble, but you know I'm a law nerd, right? Why is a sylvan elf speaking Quenya, not Cinderin? Maybe I'm overthinking this. I mean, obviously I'm overthinking this since there is very little thinking involved in the show, but um, okay, fine. They exchange a few words in Quenya, and it is very clear that Adar wants his evil sword key thingy, because it's very important, in fact. <laughs> but I'll come back to that in a few moments. Of course, you know, they don't really want to give it away. So Adar does a classic baddie. He bumps one rando off, or I mean, he has an orc bump one rando off. No, you still don't want to give it to me. All right, kill that rando in the corner. No, you still don't want to. Um, your woman there, Bronwyn on the table? How about I kill her? And there, Arondi's like, okay, Okay, chill. No, you're not gonna kill my woman. You're not gonna kill, you know, Theo's mum. I'm gonna give you the thingy. And just as Adar is grabbing for the thingy, wrapped up in cloth, the cavalry arrives. <laughs> and so the next few minutes is basically this battle montage. And there were so many things that were wrong and stupid. And I kept asking why. I'll get to the specifics of what I asked myself watching this montage. So the cavalry arrives. Now, <laughs> for one thing, the Numenorians on horse back with their lances or spears, what have you, and their helmet with, you know, a queue of horse hair looked a lot like the Rohirrim. I'm sorry, but once again, they were trying to make a callback, very obviously, to PJ's movies, so Numenorians apparently <laughs> knock off Rohirrim. Yay, and not their own thing, as they fucking should be being freaking Numenorians, but never mind. So they're hacking, slashing orcs left, right, and center. It's absolute chaos, mayhem, and then you see off on a hill, you see Miri next to her or a few other riders, and 
then Isildur. But I thought Isildur was not supposed to be a warrior. No? Okay. <laughs> Miri tells him directly, go. So he goes on his horse. The other dudes next to Miri, I guess they're her personal guards, they don't follow, but that was a bit weird. Fine, so Isildur gallops down into the village. He tries fighting, gets saved by his dad. That was nice. And then Elendia almost dies, and he's saved by Halibro on a horse. He shot at the orc with his spear, knocking him flat. So Elendil was saved. And there's a fair bit of just, ah, oh, for fuck's sake. Because <laughs> guess who rides in? Fury as Xena, warrior princess, Gally on her horse, and Gally pulls stunts that I'm pretty sure the showrunners think look cool. They actually look stupid though. That's not how you fight in a battle. Like, I'm sorry, if someone tried to pull that off, nine times out of 10, they'd be dead. But of course, she's perfect Gally, so she's not going to be killed by this. But so an orc shoots at her, and instead of deflecting with a shield, as you would expect in that kind of setup. No, she kind of just half falls off her horse and rides on the side like that. That works in a video game. If you want to make battle a wee bit realistic on television, don't do that. No, it's not cool. It's fucking stupid. And she does that twice too. Also, why doesn't Gally have a helmet? Why in fuck's name would you go into battle where there are archers and spears flying around and not have a fucking helmet on your head. I'm sorry, but um, elves can die from wounds sustained in battle. Realistically, she should have gotten a spear or an arrow straight through her fucking head. <laughs> but I mean, she's perfect galley, obviously. She got that thick plot armor, am I right? Same goes for Halbro, because Halbro doesn't have the same armor as every other Numenorean. He has like the same like fish scale plating as the others. That doesn't actually look that good, but never mind. Except it's brown instead of white. Why? Don't ask. But here again, he does not have a helmet. Every other Numenorean warrior has a helmet and he's just a human too. He's not, you know, an elf like stunning and brave galley. So, um, no helmet. Again, you take an arrow to your fucking temple, mate, you're dead. Just end of story, but plot armor be thick with those two. Since the battle seems to be going south for the baddies, Adar, you know, thinks to himself, well, I got my evil sword key thingy. That's all I needed. So he steals a Numenorean horse and gets the fuck out. Except Gally sees this, of course, and she pursues him. Yay! We get another chase scene in the woods. And Halbro joins in on the fun as well. And weirdly enough, <laughs> Halbro? Basically, there's a pincer move done by Gally and Halbro. Gally is chasing Adar, and then Halbro, who is following the same trail as Gally, magically comes into the scene from the other side. How does that fucking work? Again, geography apparently just does not exist. There are multiple holes in the space-time continuum in Middle-earth, apparently. Wormholes and shit. Okay, that's interesting. And basically, Halbro manages to trip up Adar's horse, and Adar is thrown from his horse, onto the ground. And Halbro is very angry at Adar. Quite strange. He looms over him, he has his spear in hand, he says, do you remember me? Adar's like, no. Who? To be fair, he does taunt Halbro. He's like, um, did I kill your woman? No. Did I kill your child? No. He, 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 I'm an evil baddie, am I right? So Halbro is quite annoyed by all of this, and he's basically about to shank the dude. But then Gally basically calms him down and talks him out of shanking Adar with a spear. And she tells him, look, you're not going to quench your thirst with seawater. Ah, yes, Gally. We do remember that line from one of the previous episodes. It was fucking moronic then. It is fucking moronic now. Just, we got it. Seawater, bad for your health. Could you please move on from this idiotic metaphor? Please and thank you. But so that does seem to do the trick. So Halbro does not kill Adar, and Adar is taken prisoner. Back at the village, everyone seems to be quite happy with the fact the baddies have been defeated for now. No one seems to care about, you know, the battlefield wounded or corpses around them. No, I guess there were no dead, except we know for a fact that people died, but no one cares. They're all making merry. Good for them, I guess. Gally, for her part, is in a barn with Adar. Adar is tied up to a pillar in the barn. Gally's giving her the good old interrogation treatment. So we do get confirmation that Adar is, in fact, the first orc or proto orc, because he's still looks like an elf. Again, no explanation. Right, I forgot, not supposed to think about these things. So Gally continues with her questioning. Where the fuck is Sauron? Where are the other baddies? 
etc, etc. And then Adar tries to talk back to her to give some background info. He says that Sauron actually, after Morgoth was defeated, tried to rip repent of his evil ways. Now, that is somewhat lore accurate, but then he goes into a fairly inaccurate tangent that Sauron was actually kind of a goody to start with. And he wanted to help out the Southlands and just make a land where people would live in peace and be happy. And I'm like, that's um, fake news, but okay. That being said, he then leads into the fact that apparently Sauron wanted to get mastery over flesh. He was enslaved to flesh, but he wanted to gain mastery over it. I think this is supposed to allude to the fact Sauron, Myron, Anatar is supposed to be a shapeshifter. So up until now, future is not actually shapeshifted. That would be lore inaccurate. But again, at this point, who cares? And again, Adar tries to make a case for the orcs. You know, we just want to live like everything and everyone else. We have the right to live and not be pointlessly, mindlessly massacred. We are living creatures. We were enslaved by Morgoth, but now we are free of Morgoth. Why can't we just live in peace? Leave us the fuck alone. Adar also tells Gali that yes, in fact, Sauron did have an evil lab, <laughs> magic lab in the north. That place you saw in episode one with the ice troll and shit. So that was his lab. He wanted to figure out how to gain mastery over flesh. So shapeshift, that's what I'm assuming. But you know, it didn't work. And Adar had beef with Sauron. Oh yes, because Sauron used orcs in his experiments. And that's not nice. You should not mindlessly torture orcs. Hashtag justice for orcs. So Adar was very angry at this and Adar says, I in fact killed Sauron. Oh, well all right then. And Gally doesn't buy it, not one tiny little bit. And so as we all know Gally tends to do, she gets big mayed, like really big mayed. She is pissed, she wants to know what the fuck Sauron is. You're gonna tell me you mofo. And she bends towards Adar and she says, you know what you fucking motherfucker, I'm going to kill every last orc and I'm going to torture them and I'm going to keep your life so you can see all of your children fucking die in agony and then I will kill you. Gally is in fact a psycho. Hashtag Gally is a general title psycho. Hashtag Gally is a sadistic psycho. This is supposed to be Galadriel. Can we all remember this for a minute? This is supposed to be Galadriel, an ethereal being who did have ambition. Yes, she did make mistakes. Yes, she was power hungry to a certain extent. Yes, but this is the woman who gifts three strands of her golden hair to a dwarf because that's all he wants from her. That's this. Tell me the connection between the two because I am actually not fucking seeing it. Because, audience say it with me, Gally is a genocidal and sadistic psycho. And also once again, hashtag Adar did nothing wrong, hashtag justice for orcs, hashtag Adar is actually the good guy in the scenario. And so Adar still kind of tries to fuck with her and he tries to give her a bit of a Nietzschean philosophy, you know, that whole if you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss gazes back into you, that kind of thing. First he says something to the effect of you're so obsessed with chasing Sauron, you're kind of becoming evil yourself. And second sick burn, he says the search for Morgoth's successor, so Sauron, should have ended in your own mirror. Oh, snap! <laughs> She's basically about to kill him, even though she said she wanted to keep him alive so he could know that all his children are being massacred and tortured by her. But no, she, she really big mad, so she's about to kill him. Halbro comes in and Halbro says, Oi, Gally, calm the fuck down. We do not want to kill our prisoner of war. That's against the Geneva Convention, you know. He talks her out of it, he calms her down. She's like, mm -hmm. but she leaves. Then Adar asks Halbro, who the fuck are you though? Because you asked me if I remembered you, I don't. But Halbro just gives him, I don't know, a meaningful stare and walks out of the barn with Gally. After this white hot tension, aggressive tension, we slip into sexual tension because Halbro and Gally have a lover's moment. Because you all know that's what they actually are deep down. They're sitting down on a log by the woods and they're calming down together and Halbro explains that fighting at her side, he's never felt so free as when he did that with her and it was just a beautiful feeling. And Gally says, I felt it too. Now, I'm sorry, but in any other CW production, you would see them start kissing wildly and then have sex on the log they're sitting on. You all know that's what should be happening because this is not talking by any means. So you might as well throw some gratuitous sex in this bitch. But alas, no, it stays at that level of very hot sexual tension. They 
almost kiss. They exchanged that meaningful lover's stare like, yes, oh god, it felt so good fighting by your side. You all know it's there. It's coming. Ship fucking confirmed. Back at the village where everyone is still making merry, Howl Bro is brought into the scene and Miri presents him as the peasants, the Southlands, long lost monarch and Bronwyn is like oh my god and like all the people around her gathering around Halbro and they're so impressed oh my god it's the king we were promised ah discount return of the king yay and so basically he's crowned king I mean you know metaphorically there is no crown there yet but so they just all accept him as king. Like, no verifying his genealogy, no verifying who the fuck he is, no, um, Miri, well, okay, colonist. She put a satellite king in the Southlands. Actually, you know what, strategic <laughs> move on her part, I guess. Then we cut to Theo and Rondi having another moment. A stepdad stepson moment. Shall we put it that way? Yes, we shall. So they're sitting together and Rondi basically, you know, produces the evil sword key thing wrapped up in cloth and he asks asks Theo, are you all right? You know, it was very stressful and upsetting what happened, etc. blah, blah. And then Theo says, yeah, but you know, I'm kind of, um, I can't remember which word he uses, but basically he says he's not feeling too good, but it's not because of the battle, it's because he can't have his salt key thing anymore. Because he bonded with it, you see? He fed it its blood, you know? That's, it's a deep relationship between weapon or mind control device and human. Yeah, like he shed blood for it, literally. But he can't keep it. It's evil. So Aronli says, you know what? Do the right thing. I'm going to give you the thing and you bring it to the Numenorians. You present it to Queen Tamiro. And he leaves. And I'm like, yo, bitch, you realize that this kid basically is expressing power hunger and that he kind of bonded with the fucking evil sword and you're just leaving it with him. Does he really deserve that level of trust that he's just going to hand it over to the Numenorians. So I'm sorry, but that's not being a responsible step-parent. Just saying. Of course, Theo, because he, he bonded to the thing and he wants it again. <laughs> yes, give me kind of like Gollum with the ring. <laughs> Let's be real. So he unpacks the thing. Oh, psych! The sword thing is gone. Oh no, this little hatchet in its stead. What could have happened to the sword key thing? Well, my good friends, it's the return of Potato Creep because Potato Creep actually survived the carnage and he made off with the sword key thing. Somehow he knows exactly what the fuck to do with it. So he's scampering off to, what the fuck was it? I don't even know because geography doesn't really exist in the show, you understand? So he's in a place and there's a, a rock pedestal, if you will, with a little groove in it. So first, Potato Creep gives it his own blood to feed the sword. So it becomes a big long sword and he pulls kind of, you know, a reverse King Arthur, the sword in the stone stunt. He plunges the sword, very essential. <laughs> into the groove, up to the, well, I mean, down to, you know what I mean, to the hilt. And then he twists it because it is in fact, literally a key. Hold on to your seat because a lot of crazy and a lot of stupid is going to unfold now. First, we see that basically by the watchtower, there's a dam. Basically the whole region starts trembling. So some serious mechanisms in the landscape at play here are being activated. And basically the dam by the watchtower breaks. A shit ton of water <laughs> gushes down the mountain cliffside into the valley. You cut very quickly to Isildur having a moment with his horse because he does like his horse -o. So you know what, I'll give him that, that's sweet. And then Lendil comes along and he says, you know, oh Numenorean horses, they bond in a very special way to their riders. And more generally, Elendil and Isildur have a dad and son moment and they hug. So I'm never gonna diss on genuine displays of familial affection, especially between male characters. I think that's actually healthy. But then, oh, the ground starts shaking. And um, you remember those holes that led to the orcs tunnels in the village that were covered up with planks? Geysers erupt everywhere, just water gushing everywhere. And people are like, what the fuck is happening? Because the water <laughs> that was released when that dam broke is just going through every single tunnel those orcs dug. And so you kind of let to understand that that's why the orcs were digging all these tunnels to channel water, a shit ton amount of water, no less. So yes, that happens in the village. So people starting to freak out just a bit. And Gally especially, she's like, ah, oh, shit. And again, because she's Gally, she gets a big mayad. I'm pretty sure she suspects that Adar pulled some shit. I mean, shit was definitely pulled, but in this instance, it was actually more, well, potato creep. Gotta give it to potato creep. Had some balls there. He really proved his devotion to Sauron and his plans. Good on him. And then you 
the water, through the tunnels, and you do see Adar in his barn, and he feels the water rumbling underground, and he's like, nice, the plan is actually going forward, win one for the baddies. And the water goes all the way up to this big-ass mountain in the distance. And um, you see the water, again, geography doesn't exist here, but so the water gets into the mountain by some cavern, and there's this big chamber inside the mountain, which is actually a volcano. I mean, to be fair, lots of mountains are technically dormant volcanoes. Fine. So big volcanic chamber, lots of lava. At first, I genuinely believed that the water would like release the Balrog. No. So waterfall hits the lava and um, boom! <laughs> Just massive explosion, massive volcanic eruption, I should say, is triggered. The mountain gets big mayed. You know, if you're familiar with the eruption of Mount St. Helens, it blows like majorly. It's just cataclysmic because it goes boom, shit ton <laughs> of lava projectiles just fly out of the mountain and they start raining down on the village. It's full on Armageddon. People are smushed by the burning rocks and you see the mountain is basically basically just disintegrating in this massive tsunami of pyroclastic flows and ash. Well, I mean, yes, basically hot burning ash. And I mean, burning as in uh, the kind of temperature that turns sand into glass. So that's what pyroclastic flows are. Very nasty shit. So this is approaching the fucking village. Everyone's freaking out. Everyone's trying to run away. But I mean, like, you don't fucking outrun a pyroclastic flow. Like, there's a couple of very famous and respected volcanologists. That's how they died. They wanted to film it because that was their passion, but that is how they died. Probably a similar thing happened at Pompeii, you know, and people were basically instantly encased in like a shell of ash and shit, so cataclysmic event, right? So I just don't know how they're supposed to outrun that, but you know, plot armor be thick in this bitch, but Gali, you know what Gali does? As basically the end of the world or mini end of the world is happening, she like whoops up the main field of vision and this massive pyroclastic flow is like headed straight for her. She doesn't quite pull a come at me bro, but she's like just all right, I'm gonna wait. <laughs> Bitch, just wait. And that's how the episode ends. And so I'm like, you wanna know what this shit is, my friends? I mean, it's not confirmed, but it has to be. This is basically how fucking Mount Doom is created. I mean, if it is actually Mount Doom, one, I would expect magic to actually trigger it, not a legit geophysical event. But um, uh, again, law inaccuracy, because in fact, Mount Doom was created by Melkor, aka Morgoth, in the first stage, so it should already exist and not be triggered by basically a made-up waterfall in a volcanic chamber. But again, you're not supposed to think about these things and no one cares. <laughs> Oh my fucking god, like, just what is this show, though? I will give the episode this. Stuff happened, but there was so much egregious, stupid, and nonsense in this episode. I was like, what the actual fuck? Just all of those military details that even I could fucking spot as being absolutely stupid and inaccurate and just what? <laughs> The armor, the battle dynamics, the fast traveling, the plot armor, she be thick, like I said. Lots and lots and lots of just plain stupid. Oh my god. And then apparently, guess what? You just needed a key to open Mount Doom. And Gally apparently wants to bathe in a paraclastic flow. Because you all know she's not dead, right? I mean, you know, there's a mini trailer at the end of this episode showing, like, the first few minutes of the next episode. And actually, a lot of people have pointed this out. That scene in one of the trailers where she's covered in, like, orange dust. A lot of people have called it Cheeto dust. Well, that's the aftermath of Mount Doom coming into existence. But I'm like, that's just fucking ridiculous at this point. Elves are not lava proof. Elves are not pyroclastic flow proof. Just, and humans certainly aren't, yet you can be certain all the main protagonists are still alive after this. I'm not really sure what the point of this was, to show that Gali is basically a fucking god at this point, or a goddess. Because realistically, she should in fact die and her soul should be yeeted back to Valinor, because that's how it should actually work in Middle-earth, in the Legendarium. Actually, I squared it somewhat in my mind as the following. Gali has such a burnt cinder of a soul and heart that she's heatproof. But unlike even Daenerys Targaryen, she just survived a funeral pyre, <laughs> not a fucking volcanic eruption, just what the hell. And you know, during this episode, I really, really legitimately for the first time 
felt this is fan fiction. And I mean, not just in the way the script was written, the plot was outlined, all of that. Seeing it on screen, I actually felt like I was seeing, I don't know, convention with LARPers. No disrespect to LARPers, they can do some great stuff. But it really felt like that. It felt actually this. I've never watched it, but I know there's a French show called Camelot. That is kind of a parody of Arthurian legend stuff. And I got those vibes. I was like, this is a weird fan fiction-y lapping of bits of the legendarium. And it just felt so fake, actually on screen. Maybe it's that cavalry chart scene that really broke it for me. I don't know. But I was watching this and I'm like, this is really fan fiction. It has absolutely nothing to do with the legendarium, but it still shits on it by referencing a bunch of lore stuff and character stuff. Because I mean, Gally is not Galadriel. Again, hashtag Gally is a general title psycho, hashtag Gally is a sadistic psycho. And again, hashtag <laughs> justice folks, hashtag Adar is actually the good guy. Even though he kind of wanted to create Mount Doom and block out sunlight, but that's because he likes his Uruk homies, his children. So yeah, you gotta give it to him. He's a baddie, but he's a baddie with heart. <laughs> Better in my book than a goodie who's a fucking psychopath. <laughs> Why are they making her this way? Are they actually expecting the viewers to see her as a good guy? Is this real life? <laughs> so that was my deep dive for episode 6 of The Lord of the Rings. The rings of what the actual fuck am I watching at this point? As usual, if you want to share your own thoughts and comments, please feel free to do so in the comments down below or on the Discord server. There is also a link for it in the description box. But on that note, I hope you'll have a lovely day, evening, whichever time of day you prefer. Do take good care of yourselves. Thank you for the continued support, and I shall see you all hopefully reasonably soon in another video. But until then, bye bye.